Okay, yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Alistair Leith. Um, I'm the uh, founder and director of the Online Astronomy Society Academy. Um, sort of among the uh, various activities we run, uh, we run GCSE Astronomy by Distance Learning. Um, joined by Dr. Nigel Marshall, who you can also see there, and 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 he'll introduce himself in a minute. We're, we're going to start from scratch with the introductions because there'll be new faces and new names who we've not met. So we're starting as if this is the first time ever that we've done them. So, um, <clears throat> as I say, I'm the director, and uh, we've been running GCC Astronomy by Distance Learning for well over 10 years. Uh, since 2017, the new spec that's come out uh, which just requires the observational tasks. And essentially, we do offer this from about £330 uh, for an accelerated course, which means we generally expect people to join up to, to complete it in the year. Um, it's not really supposed to be completed that way uh, in, in that time frame, but some do and some ask for it, so that's what we offer. But also to make it fair, if you're unable to sit within the year, so if that is to say you were to sign up now at the tail end of September, theoretically your support would finish next June. But because I think it's a bit crass to be charging you another 150 or so pounds, we extend it automatically for another year. Because why should you have to pay more? Uh, because if you can't sit within the year for whatever reason, so we offer that. Unfortunately, these webinars that we're offering here, which is where we go over past exam paper questions, exam technique, and, and how to answer some of the, these questions, um, that that's an added extra. Me personally, um, I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not a professional astronomer. I'm actually a professional chemist <laughs> with a degree from London University in chemistry. Um, I've been working in ICT for the past twenty years, but then moved across into training. Uh, where I've been working primarily uh, teaching first aid, teaching astronomy for local authority, um, also taught first aid until re relatively recently. And now I focus on online and e-learning and developing courses. And I'm also the founder and creator of Space Cadets, which uh, is something that we that I'll discuss in a separate webinar once it's been revamped. So that's all from me. Um, Nigel, if you'd like to say a few words. Um, very little for me, really. I think we're ready to uh, get stuck into these uh, these exam papers and show uh, our visitors uh, what they can expect should they continue with uh, GCSE astronomy to the exams. But I have a um, a career uh, teaching mostly physics, but quite a lot of astronomy as well. I've got two degrees in astrophysics, so uh, uh, keep up with um, what's up to date as well. And I'll be recommending uh, three websites that students must really dip into every day or two because they tell you what's in the sky, what physically is happening, you know, in the distant galaxies. They tell you uh, lots and lots and lots of, um, of really important uh, uh, ideas. So it really helps to uh, to keep going with, with with those. Right. I think we'll go straight into the... Um... Yep. I think let's continue. So if you want to start up your usual there, Nigel, and... Uh... Yep. So I'll go into share screen and uh, what we'll do is to uh, find this. Um, ooh, 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 ooh. Now then, <laughs> we've got a little hitch here. Um, oh, well, there it is. Right. OK, you should be able to see um, the beginning of an exam paper. And what I'd like to do today is to show you the type of question and the content, because if you are new to this, you are just starting the course, won't have studied everything just yet. So that's uh, that's absolutely fine. It's just an introduction to really what you can expect, what the type of questions are, what the um, demand is, which is which is quite high. Um, so we have two exam papers. Paper one is all to do with naked eye astronomy and paper two is all to do with astronomy using instruments like telescopes and binoculars and cameras and things like that. So the whole specification has been uh, uh, split up that way. And there are two exam papers, both an hour and uh, 45 minutes long. And here is paper one, naked eye astronomy. So Let's see if we can uh, go through here. Uh, be useful if I turn off the um, little bit here, but I, I think we've got enough on the screen, right? So 
Um, if you can see this, all the usual instructions, you have to use black ink because um, blue ink doesn't uh, get scanned very easily. Uh, read advice, read each question carefully. Try to answer each question. Yeah, that's important. Um, check your answers if you've got time. Obviously, uh, useful things there. We've got a formula sheet. So most formulas are given. Looks a little bit complicated at the moment. Don't worry about that. All will be revealed uh, in the course. We've got some data on the Earth, Moon, Sun, then to stars, sidereal and synodic days. What are those I can hear you asking? Well, again, we can come into that uh, later on. And then we have some uh, planetary data, which uh, is sideways on this. But if I just scroll to the planets and dwarf planets themselves and just invite the audience just to uh, move their position just a little bit. You've got all the data here that um, several of the questions actually uh, require you to, to use and they invite you to use the data and uh, so on. So that's quite uh, quite a nice little feature. And then we get on to the questions. The 10 questions altogether, and they're supposed to be of an increasingly difficult nature. So we start off quite straightforward and um, we end up with um, quite quite tricky uh, questions towards the end. It doesn't always work like that, but the progress, the progression through the paper is supposed to be getting more and more difficult as we go through. So to begin with, we normally have one or two questions, maybe three, maybe even four questions that have just objective multiple choice uh, questions. And they really are mostly just te te testing factual information. Not all, but most of them are just testing factual stuff. So here we are. So we've got an image of the full moon and we've got three features labeled X, Y, and Z. And what you have to do is basically find what the features are. So there we go, multiple choice. We're not going to go through this today, through the answers. We're going to do that next week when you've had a chance to maybe have a go at some of those. So the uh, actual question paper should be available from the uh, from the VLE. So we've got uh, feature X and feature Y. We've got some sensible and some not so sensible options. What's feature Z as well? So that is just really at the, uh, the strain of the eye, I think. You can just about make out some of these with the uh, with the naked eye. And then we've got something slightly different. A student writes a description of how some objects appear when viewed with the naked eye. So we've got moving green curtains of light. It obviously has to be the aurora. A bright star that suddenly appears in the night sky and then fades. Some of you will know already that that's a supernova. I'm not supposed to be telling you the answers, but I'm just kind of introducing this because these are fairly straightforward. Bright streak of light moving across the sky. Um, yeah, it's not a supernova. It's not a galaxy. So there we are, DC. And that's question one, six marks. Right, so now we go on. Unrelated, some of these. Sometimes they are related. So we've got the moon passing in front of Venus and blocking its light. Venus passing in front of the sun's disk. Not going to do that for another 80 years, I think. The angle between Venus and the sun is measured from the Earth. So that's uh, something a little bit more uh, mathematical in there. And then we've got a question about uh, naked eye techniques. So how do we observe faint stars? Why do we wait for 20 minutes in the dark? And there we are. Now, I must stress that going out and making, taking and making some of the observation is really going to be very important. Some students just don't go outside, don't know what the moon looks like. They do, don't recognize an image of the moon, even if it's upside down. Um, it really is important that you follow this up. You're studying astronomy. Astronomy is a observational science. You, we can't do many experiments. Maybe 5% maybe of astronomy is carrying out experiments. That's the kind of space science, you know, sending rockets and sending satellites and probes to the, to the, um, to the planets and asteroids and so on. Most of it is observational stuff. So really, we are encouraging you as much as possible to actually go out, take some observations. All right. 
even the experience of waiting for 20 minutes and seeing the stars actually come out and actually appear is just uh, quite, quite amazing. Realising, oh, we'd better not observe from here because I, I can see the kitchen window from one of my neighbours. And that doesn't really matter. It's just that the light is going to affect um, you as you are doing some observations. So one reason why a pinhole camera would not be suitable for observing a faint star. There's always a few clues in here. It's a faint star. So the image is going to be even fainter. Right. A quite tricky one, number three here. The moon is an oblate sphere. Yes, it's a slightly squashed sphere and has a mean diameter of 3,475 kilometres. There's a gap in there which shouldn't actually be there. You'll find that I'm a bit critical of the exam board sometimes. I think I was just having a bit of a chuckle there. I do tend to point out um, where they make errors, which they shouldn't do. But the four digits doesn't have a, um, doesn't have a, a gap in. It's five digits or more that merits a gap. That's the SI um, convention. Anyway, quite a nice little tricky one, 3A. Impacts from space rocks, what do they form? Well, that's, I think, pretty straightforward, pretty obvious. Large planes of magma that have turned solid. Again, you can see these as darker grey on the moon's surface compared with the lighter grey. Hey, now we've got the moon. To, you can see that in the early paper, we really are not very far from home. We've not mentioned stars yet. We've not mentioned galaxies. They appear more, I think, on paper two. But at least on paper one, we should get some stars, but not just yet. So we've got uh, the motion of the, the moon taking 27.3 days to orbit the Earth, even though that's not the lunar phase um, period of 29 Point five days, and we'll explain in the course what the difference is there. Then a little calculation, one mark, so it has to be quite straightforward. The angle through which the moon appears to move in one hour against the background stars. So that's a nice little calculation to work out. And a state question, state two reasons why it's difficult to observe the moon moving against the background stars with the naked eye. So why is it difficult to do? Okay, the moon does move from night to night and go through its phases. Quite taxing mathematically some of these. So there we are. We've got some more multiple choice here. It's not all like this. And as you can see, other things creep in here. Geocentric model of the universe as opposed to the heliocentric model. And uh, we're going to a little bit of more history here. Um, part B, the position of Mars shown on a uh, star chart. And you can see that the apparent math path of Mars, although it increases to the left, there is a little loop-the-loop -loop or zigzag feature, which always puzzled the early um, naked eye astronomers, the ancient Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and the Babylonians just couldn't get their head around this loop the loop motion. So there we are, a chart to uh, do a little bit of interpretation on and a test of the coordinates that we use on the sky, which are right ascension and declination. So we've got RA and deck, not ant and deck, RA and deck. Are they still going, those two, Alistair? I think they are, aren't they? Right, what's the name of the dashed line? Um, pretty easy, straightforward. And then we've got to just interpret that chart. A little bit of uh, information gathered there. And um, we've got to work out the number of months that Mars appears to move backwards. Probably usually two or three, something like that. And, well, to try and... Um, explain that Ptolemy, who was a great um, thinker about 2000 and something years ago, he proposed a model with the addition of epicycles, which are kind of wheels within wheels. So again, something perhaps if you want to have a go at some of these questions, have a look at the um, geocentric model of Ptolemy. I think it's a silent P in there, but I just slip it in for good measure. Okay, now we've got a question about the tides. What have the tides got to do with astronomy? You're probably asking a lot. 
because it's the pull of the moon mainly and the pull of the sun on the Earth's water that gives rise to the Earth spinning into these high water and low water regions and that gives us the tides. Again, question five, so halfway through the paper here, so we're looking at sort of targeting um, sort of level five, six, that sort of, uh, sort of thing, or grades uh, five and six, maybe venturing into seven a wee little bit, but we've got to uh, have a good study of this. The question says, explain why there are two high tides each day. Um, that's not quite right. It's a little bit of a... Um, little bit of a uh, generalization. Uh, the time between high tides is not 12 hours, it's 12 hours and 40 minutes, something like that. And there's a um, video tutorial about that on the uh, on the course where I explain a little bit more about what's what's going on. So we've got to um, study this uh, this table, analyze the table, so have a good study and work out what the date is when the moon's at its first or last quarter hmm so that's quite a tricky one uh, the first when the moon is at the first and highest quarter you're getting few you're getting smaller high tides and quite larger um low tides there, there's there's very little tidal variation so you've got to do a little bit of studying here and, and work that out mm, quite quite tough it won't be the 27th of october 5.3 meters and 2.0 meters is quite a uh, considerable um, change. So basically, you've got to find the time interval. Um, you've got to find the, uh, the the time for which the level of water has the smallest difference. Mm. 23rd, well, I'll let you have a look at that, everybody. Right, so you can see that some of this is now a little bit tricky. It's all astronomy related, of course. And the Greek astronomer Aristarchus of Samos used a total lunar eclipse to estimate the diameter of the moon. Again, quite a bit of um, calculation here and interpreting this, uh, this diagram. But it's all in there. I remember drawing one of these when I uh, wrote the uh, textbook or the guide, rather. It's not supposed to be a textbook as such. It's a guide to get you exploring and going out far afield and finding some resources for yourselves. But what we can do with this is to work out the ratio of the Earth's diameter to the Moon's diameter, which is uh, which is great. A nice um, method riddled with errors, but a great, um, really important, superb technique. Um, to determine the ratio of the diameters of these two bodies. Then a simple question about eclipses, total lunar eclipse, why do they take longer or why do they last longer than a solar eclipse when viewed from Earth? Quite straightforward. I see. Generous question there. Then we've got um, an extract from an article about astronomy. Here we go. And this is a bit about the history of astronomy and Tycho Bray and how Kepler used uh, Tycho's methods to work out his three laws of planetary motion. Now, the first two are quite straightforward. The third one is quite tricky and often has a calculation involved. And here it is. Kepler's third law can be written as t squared over r cubed is a constant. Most students haven't met any questions like this. They've seen v equals ir, or the extension of a spring is equal to the spring constant times the force, uh, I think that's the right way around. I'm not sure. <laughs> Here, we've suddenly got tables of data and we've got moons of Jupiter and we've got to calculate the orbital period of Ganymede. Well, we've got to calculate the constant, basically, and um, then apply it to one uh, planet and then to Ganymede. Uh, sorry, to one moon and then to, uh, to Ganymede. There we are. If you're thinking the maths is quite tricky, we do go through um, quite a bit of training with the uh, with the maths. And Moon X orbits Saturn with a mean orbit radius of that. Why doesn't it have an orbital period of 1.76 days? It's a little bit tricky. But then again, this question is about the moons of Jupiter. And then suddenly, one of the moons here 
moon X is orbiting Saturn. So it's not orbiting the same body, and therefore that constant is not the same. If you're thinking this is all a little bit complicated, I think we'll agree it is, but it's all very doable. It's all, it, we, we teach it to you, and this is all very, uh, very nice. We've got the plough, not in its familiar orientation, but that's the kind of little quirk that the examiners put in sometimes. You can still see the pointer stars. You can still see the stars that point to um, Arcturus. So we've got to indicate those in part A. And now we've got a question about seeing conditions, which is all to do with the twinkling. And again, this is something that you can see firsthand if you go out and observe um, the stars and the constellations and so on. So she's going to try and count the number of times that the star appears to twinkle. Right. And she repeats this on four nights in March. And there we are. And the student concludes something about scene conditions. And that is something that we measure on the Antoniadi scale. And again, that's uh, there in the course. Remember, these are questions for students who have completed the course, not for students who are, you know, about to start, obviously. Uh, but I'm just trying to show you the type of question and the demand and the level uh, which um, you'll um, happily um, accept and, uh, and carry out some answers. So we've got to look at comment on the accuracy of our conclusion. So we don't know if she's right or whether she's wrong yet. Give two reasons why Polaris was a suitable star for her investigation. Yeah, why Polaris? Why she decided to do uh, to do that? Two reasons, right? Does it say where she is? Yes, she's in London. So there we go. There's um, a little bit of a hint for an answer to to that. And then six marks. There are two questions which, which we call six markers, and here. You are marked on um, using levels, which then we'll explain to you later. So uh, she's got this method and looking at the effect of sky glow and what she's doing. You, what you have to do is to evaluate how good her method is. Good points and bad points. I won't say any more about that one. Lots of space to write an answer here. They want almost an essay. Yeah. Right. Number eight. Scale model of the solar system. As you can see on paper one, it's, you know, a little bit of stars, but it's mostly the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, we're really on kind of more familiar, familiar ground before on paper two, venturing into the, uh, into the deep cosmos. So scale models, why do we need scale models to show these? Um, well, the actual distances are too great, I would say. Uh, I don't know whether that's the right answer, but that's what I would put on here. Um, so we've got still some models. We've got use the information in the formula and data sheet. So we mentioned that and talked about that earlier on. Proxima Centauri, the nearest star system to the sun. So many light years. It looks like we're going to be um, changing into kilometers or something like that. We're given the, uh, the conversion factor there. So why wouldn't the model be good for demonstrating the distance to Proxima Centauri? Pretty obvious, the distance. Um, a little bit about the Earth. The Earth is a typical planet. So the core of the Earth is approximately 54% of the Earth's diameter. And again, using the data sheet, working out um, which planet has the same diameter as the Earth's core. Yeah. And then a little bit about the uh, the history of using shadow. Oh, should, should he, sorry, using shadow sticks at different locations. This is really reproducing Eratosthenes' uh, brilliant method of determining the circumference of the Earth. So to find the Earth's diameter, you first got to find the circumference. And again, it's a six marker there um, for you to design an experiment to do that. So you need two teams of astronomers with sticks, and you need to know uh, a little bit more than that. Um, so really, they're looking for 
um, not a description of what Eratosthenes did, but related to real students on the uh, on the Earth's surface. Good, that's fine. Again, quite a few marks there, quite a few lines as well. Number nine, sundials. Sundials very important because sundials allow us to find us the time. And if we know the time here, and if we know the time where our ship left from, we can find longitude. There we are, and make it sound so simple. So we've got to look at some similarities and differences between an equatorial sundial and a horizontal sundial. Hmm. Hmm. I don't remember seeing that in the specification. Well, I'll have a look later on. So that's something that we've got to, uh, I've just got to explore a little bit. You do get some questions on the fringe of, you know, mainstream specification. Here's the equation of time, usually in its familiar form. What's the equation of time, you might be asking? It really allows us to correct from a sundial or a shadow stick to um, our local mean time. And then we can work out our local mean time and how it differs from that at Greenwich. And we can work out, um, again, our longitude. So it's a, quite a very important technique. Right, well, we've got a question about sundials. A correctly assigned um, aligned sundial producing the following results. And we've got to uh, work out the corrected sundial reading and then work out um, the accuracy. So that is something, again, which is relatively straightforward once you followed the course. And then we've got two variations, two reasons why the equation of time is as such, and um, one is due to the Earth's tilt of its axis to the ecliptic, so that's to the sun, basically, and the other one is the fact that the Earth moves in an ellipse, and therefore its speed changes, so uh, sometimes, um, well, I won't go into too much uh, uh, detail, because that's for something that you will hopefully be learning soon. Why do we have a value of some of zero at some dates? Quite a nice little mathematical trick there, which leads us on to question number 10. Final question here. So we've got the altitude of a star between 2000 and 600. That's presumably GMT. Yes, we're told that in the table. And we've got to uh, probably complete the graph using some data, put a scale on the vertical axis, plot the remaining points. So that's quite a nice little mathematical graphical exercise. State the time at which star A culminated, quite straightforward. The hour angle, you will need to know and talk about that in the course. And in which direction is the astronomer looking? Why has A's altitude changed over the course of the observation? So something about rising and setting of stars. And circumpolar stars, a nice reference to that in part F. And then just a little bit of stellar coordinate work that's quite straightforward. So we've got to find the declination, which is effectively the latitude of this star. Um, and there's a formula there that isn't in the formula sheet. So they nicely give you that. Um, looks a wee bit complicated. You might be thinking, oh, there's four words there I don't understand. Altitude, culmination, declination, uh, latitude, I presume. I presume you do know, actually, so that's only, uh, only three. But all is explained in the course. And that, in a slightly shorter time than 40 minutes, Alistair, is a overview of a typical, this is last year's, Paper one, naked eye astronomy. Some easy, some challenging, some requiring quite a lot of thought, a bit of detail in these experiments. There we are, that's paper one. And hope you've, I hope I've not rushed through it too much. I'm trying to uh, keep it a nice steady pace, but at the same time, try and put in as much of the uh, sort of comments on the style of the exam rather than actually go through them. And answers to selected questions we will look at next month. 
Right. Well, I can see there's been lots of uh, chat. I haven't been able to uh, see what the chat is, but I'll hold it, hand you back to uh, Alistair and see if there's anything that I can add to um, to the chat there. So I can start sharing my screen. <laughs> 